good morning everybody today we are here to discuss interest as you all know that there are different factors of production like land labor capital entrepreneurship and all these factors of production are rewarded out of the earnings of the produce whatever is produced it's finally disposed of and whatever money is received it's distributed amongst all these factors this is known as the reward for these factors we discussed earlier rent rent is the reward for the use of land similarly interest is a reward for the use of capital so today we will be discussing interest today we all know interest as to what it is and why do we get it even without knowing technically about it we have been using this term but the truth is we need to know as to how this concept evolved over the period of time and if you think on these lines then of course the entire theory of interest comes into existence now going by the growth of this theory of interest we get to know that interest is a reward for the use of capital some of the economists gave it a new term uh, rather i mean gave a new term to capital that is loanable funds they said that what are whatever are the loanable funds reward for use of these loanable funds is known as interest so put it either way either call it as capital or call it as loanable funds whatever way but whatever reward is being given to the capital is known as interest this interest is also given as a reward for parting away with liquidity you see everybody prefers to keep money in the liquid form but if you give this money to some users by way of capital after making savings for a long periods of time so when you when you make savings then you sacrifice the liquidity then you sacrifice the present use of that uh, money you do not use that money in the present and you give that money to the users obviously therefore one needs to be rewarded for the liquidity parting away with the liquidity or parting away with the pleasures of the present so interest can be defined in these two ways one interest is a reward for use of capital second interest is a reward for use of loanable funds third interest is a reward for waiting interest is a reward for parting away with liquidity whatever way we put it but the truth is that interest is something which is given for the use of capital now this interest in economics has been considered to be of two types one net interest and the other one gross interest now what is this net interest whatever is the net amount given to capital it's known as net interest net reward net reward given to capital is known as net interest but there is another term which is known as gross interest now what do we mean by gross interest when we say gross interest then we include amount paid for capital plus amount paid for sacrifice of capital plus amount paid for inconvenience plus amount paid for management of the uh, money which has been given so gross interest is a wider term it's a term of wider import it includes all the related aspects and truly speaking these aspects are also important you cannot say that management of funds given is not to be done say somebody has got the business of giving funds then obviously that person will have to create an infrastructure to manage the uh, receipt of interest recovery of interest from the sources to which money has been given 
so that inconvenience is also there. Similarly, waiting or inconvenience which has been caused to the person who has saved the money and the money is being given to the user for producing different goods and commodities. So this is how we define interest in two groups. One is net interest, other one is gross interest. I repeat it once again, net means net amount payable to capital only, payable for capital, use of capital only. Then uh, we come to theories of interest. When we talk about theories of interest, then what do we exactly mean? Theories means the ideologies, the concepts, the techniques which developed over the period of time. So many concepts developed regarding the payment of interest, determination of interest over the period of time. These can be divided into two groups. One is the old theories of interest and the other one is the new theories of interest. So if you take old theories of interest, these are also more than one, many theories of interest which were developed by earlier economists and later on the new economists they made certain improvements on what earlier economists have said and that's how uh, these are the two classifications one is the older theories of interest and the other one is the uh, new theories of interest. If we take the older theories of interest then what we get is at least four theories. One is marginal productivity theory of interest. Second one is abstinence or waiting theory of interest. Third one is AGO or Austrian theory of interest. And fourth one is Fisher's time preference theory of interest. Now these are the four theories which are considered to be the earlier theories of interest. Now these theories are not being used these days. I mean presently when we determine interest or when we discuss about interest, these theories are not used directly. But of course indirectly one cannot avoid the use because the idea generates at a point of time, it goes on maturing over the period of time. So all these steps which come in between may not be so important today, but they are really important because they have contributed to the development of the thought regarding a particular subject or a particular theory. So these theories do not hold good in today's economics, but these theories are important and the understanding of these theories is important for a student of economics in order to be able to make a proper understanding of the term that is interest on capital. So we'll discuss these. As I said that these are not being used because of their limitations, because the earlier thought whatever was developed at that period of time was not so scientific. There were many shortcomings and that is how these were ignored or uh, these are not being used today. Most of these theories use either the supply side of capital or they use the demand side of the capital. They do not use both the sides. And by concentrating on only one side for the availability of capital will not be scientific. And that is how these theories do not hold good in the present. But then let us discuss these one by one. The first one is Marginal productivity theory of interest. This theory believes that capital is demanded, capital has got some productivity. Because with the help of capital, one can buy machines, create a plant and make production of so many things. So obviously capital has got productivity. And the fact that capital has got productivity it is demanded because of the inherent element of productivity in capital. And in this case, interest is equal, interest is considered to be equal to the marginal productivity of capital. Say whatever is the marginal productivity of capital 
equivalent to that will be the amount of interest payable to capital. And when you continuously use more and more doses of capital, then its productivity also decreases. Because productivity is subject to the law of diminishing returns. Law of diminishing returns tell us that if you constantly go on using one item, its productivity eventually declines. For production, what do you actually need? For production, you need capital. For production, you need land. For production, you need labor. Now, keeping all the factors constant and varying only and only the capital, making use of more and more units of capital will eventually result in diminishing productivity from capital. So, its productivity starts diminishing. So, in the short run, the interest may be less than the marginal productivity of capital or it may be more than the marginal productivity of capital. But in the long run, the interest payable is equal to the marginal productivity of capital. See, if the interest is less than the productivity, then more capital will be demanded. And there will come a point when interest will be equal to the marginal productivity of capital. And if the interest is higher as compared to the marginal productivity of capital, then less capital will be demanded and very soon the equilibrium will be restored or in other words, the interest will be equal to the marginal productivity of capital. So, as per this theory, marginal productivity of capital decides the interest. Whatever is the marginal productivity, that will be interest. Now, if you notice that this theory believes in one thing only and that is the productivity side of capital. It does not take into account the other issues related to determination of interest on capital. Therefore, this theory is not being used or it is it is not considered to be a proper and complete theory of interest. But yes, it is there and we must know about. The second one is abstinence or weight theory. As we all know that capital is created by savings. And how are savings created? Savings are created by sacrificing the current consumption or by waiting to consume in future. We do not consume in present. Rather, we consume in future. We have a hope that when more money is received, then we will be making the use of it. So what happens is that people who save and supply capital, they have to wait. And interest is a reward for this wait only. This is the abstinence or waiting theory. Now, once again, this is also a one sided theory, one sided in the sense that it takes into account the supply side of capital. That is how the supply is, how the capital is supplied. It does not take into account the demand side of the capital, which is also very important to focus upon. So abstinence or weight theory tells us that savings and the supply of capital is the result of weight. I mean, waiting to consume the money earned. Rather, people start saving it and then they wait to use it in future. Therefore, this theory is known as abstinence or waiting theory. Third one is AGO or Austrian theory of interest. Now, it's known to everybody that people prefer present to future. There is a saying that trust no future, however pleasant. But still people save under the hope that in future they will be making use of this money. So, obviously, they should be given an AGO for it. Now, people part away with their savings. And because they part away with their savings happily for the users, 
because users get the capital and with the help of capital they create various items of consumption and production so those who have created capital those who have supplied capital they have made a sacrifice and therefore a premium must be paid to them and this premium is known as agio this agio or premium is to be paid on the use of capital because of sacrifice of its present use this is how this theory is known as agio theory or premium theory so again this is also one sided and it does not focus on any other direction now fisher's time preference this is the third important theory fisher's time preference theory of interest fisher gave a theory that people prefer present as compared to future and if they make savings that means they are not preferring present rather they are making a sacrifice of their preference for present and they are postponing their use for the future so this is uh, fisher's time preference liquidity preference depends on so many things one is the size of income say poor people need to take care of the present with their incomes they hardly have the capacity to save but those who are moderately rich or rich they can save so size of income is an important determinant for studying the fisher's theory of interest second one is if there is an expectation that income will reduce in future then a person may tend to save there is a there is an indication that in future my income will reduce so whatever i am earning at the moment i'll try to save it so that when my income is reduced then i may be able to use this money and this is how savings are created if future is certain say whatever i am getting at present i'll be getting the same money in the future also then perhaps there won't be Uh, a tendency to save uh, there won't be any rather urgency to save then nature of individuals is also important because nature of individuals is a decisive factor there are people who have the habit to save and there are people who do not have the habit to save so these are the two types of people one group believes in savings other one doesn't believe in savings this is on this basis fisher says because people have a preference for present now if they sacrifice their present then whatever is paid to them it is known as interest now in this theory also what we find is that there are many weaknesses the first and the most important thing is that fisher considers to be the Uh, uh, to to be time value of money as constant fisher considers time value of money to be constant it is not so it is not true it is not correct value of money at present and value of money in future these are the two different things and today's students of economics know well about it then it is one sided it takes care of the supply side of interest only so these are the four theories of uh, older group the theories of interest given by the earlier economists the first one is marginal productivity theory second one is abstinence or weight theory third one is agio or austrian theory and fourth one is fisher's liquidity prefer time preference theory of interest now we come to this second group which is the modern theories of interest and in this group we the first one we have is classical theory of interest this theory was propounded by many economists in one way or the other these people have contributed to it like marshall pigou walrus knight and others they have contributed to the development of this theory it lays emphasis on the real elements of productivity and thrift productivity is a real element 
Thrift is also a real element and therefore this theory is known as the real theory of interest also. Then further if we go we find that this theory the demand for capital and supply of capital both are taken into account. Demand for capital is made by the producers. Supply of capital is made by the people, the high households, the corporates and the governments. So they supply capital. This is the supply side of capital. And the two forces put together, they decide the quantum of interest and the quantum of capital to be supplied. Say at this particular interest, this much of capital will be supplied. Now let us take these two separately. The first aspect that is demand for capital. Now we know that producers make a demand for capital so that production of different items is possible. In other words, capital is demanded because capital has got an inherent element of productivity in it. So capital is demanded because capital is productive. Capital has got productivity. And then law of variable proportion supplies. So as a result, if more and more units of capital are used, diminishing returns are possible. Now, if we try to fix up the relationship between the interest and capital demanded, then what we get to know is at a low rate of interest, more capital is demanded and at high rate of interest, less capital is demanded. So there is inverse relationship between interest and quantity of capital demanded. And when there is inverse relationship, we know it, uh, uh, we know it in the, uh, through the earlier studies also that the curve becomes a negatively sloped curve sloping downwards from left to right. This will become the demand curve known as DD. Now this is the curve which will tell us that more the interest less the capital demanded less the interest more the capital demanded. Now this these savings are demanded for investment in capital goods. This curve is also known as investment demand curve. So we will continue with this in the next lecture. Thank you very much.